tell you guys the work that we've done on the Hypermobility Committee. Uh, what you see here is the list of the committee members. Uh, Brad is the chair, Fred Bergman, uh, our uh, patient support group liaison, and a number of, of other folks, uh, most of whose names I trust and recognize. And if not, you should get to know them because I think we're all great people, as well as many of the people who weren't on this committee, but in the consortium. Our process was a lot of emails and phone calls over the 18 months of the initial work, then extensive discussion, heated discussion, some might say, at the conference in New York back in May. Additional discussion mostly by email since then, and the work is still in progress. We're in our ninth iteration of the manuscript, and clearly have a long way to go, but we're trying to move forward. Probably the most important thing to emphasize is that nothing, almost nothing that I'm about to tell you is consensus. Uh, it's the <laughs> majority opinion. There are definitely some things that even within the committee we're having trouble coming to uh, unanimous consensus on, and certainly when we came to the wider symposium, um, again, some heated discussion and some disagreement, which is good, and then I think also highlights what you heard already from Claire several times, and you'll hear multiple times from me. We suffer from not really knowing. Uh, most of what we've been talking about for years and still talking about today is expert opinion and anecdotal evidence, and that can only get you so far. Uh, so, part of our charter, or more specifically, the only three things I'm going to talk to you about today are the naming of this type of dollars down the syndrome. The diagnostic criteria for hypermobility EDS, and the relationship between hypermobile or HEDS and the joint hypermobility syndrome. I'm not going to really address management for two reasons. One is, as Claire just told you 10 minutes ago, it's really pretty much the same in the classical type and the hypermobile type, other than perhaps a little bit more skin concerns on the classical type. Uh, and also because there's a lack of good evidence, and most of what we know is already out there in the literature. But most importantly, we again just don't know. We just don't know. So I'm going to focus in, uh, mostly on these three things, and we'll start with naming. So um, naming was a fun discussion. <laughs> we talked about going back to the number types and calling it type three. We talked about keeping it as hypermobile or hypermobility. We talked about just not even using the term EDX, whether or not you kick it out of this charity or support group, but just go back and call it joint hypermobility syndrome and not even call it Ehlers Down. We talked about more descriptive terms, systemic or multi-systemic, polyarticular, meaning many joints. The common type, because for crying out loud, it is by far the most common type. Variable type, because it is so variable, there's so many different ways it can manifest. And additional means phenomena. And really what we're trying to do in thinking this through is, can we be more descriptive and at the same time less confusing? So I've had the problem, and I'm sure many of you as well, that patients some patients will come to me and say, well, I've got the hypermobile type and the classical type and the vascular type. And I ask them why, and they say, well, my joints are loose, so I've got the hypermobile type. And I've got skin findings, so I've got the classic type. And I've got varicose veins, so I've got vascular involvement, it must be the vascular type. That's confusing, right? And, and I think it's highly, highly unlikely that anyone has three different types, much less two different types of EDS. It's just that our naming hasn't always been clear enough to help everybody, both in the medical field and the lay of the community, understand what these things mean. And then finally, as we went through this discussion, especially at the symposium back in May, there was a number of people who felt like, you know what, we're finally, finally reaching the general health professional community and the lay public. People are finally understanding that Ehlers Down syndrome is at least worth thinking about and more common than was previously thought. And oh my goodness, please let's not change the name now when people are finally recognizing what it is. So uh, a strong support for not changing the name. So, with all that build up, the moment you've all been waiting for, right? The naming consensus? You ready for it? We don't know. We, we have not yet reached consensus. So, so uh, I'm waiting as anxiously as you are. Um, the problem is, many of us, and by us I mean all of us in this room, have strong opinions. And many of us have the self-confidence to know that we're right. And, and when two of us are intelligent and confident and know we're right, but we have different opinions, that makes for lively discussion. Uh, so that discussion continues. So uh, that's all I got for you on anyway. <laughs> Let's talk about diagnostic criteria. And first I want to do a little audience participation. By show of hands, how many of you have hypermobile type or something close to it? Now. Of you, 
How many have a known mutation that is clearly the cause of your hypermobile type? A known mutation that explains your hypermobile EDS. I've got lights glaring in my eyes, but I don't see any hands up, and I hope I don't. If your hand is up, please get together with the person you're diagnosed to and publish it. Because the point is, it ain't known. It's not known, right? You don't know. This is a problem, and it's one of those vicious cycles where the problem causes other problems and they tie back together. How can we have a gold standard to test our diagnostic criteria if we can't figure out for sure what hypermobile EDS actually is? So how do we actually develop criteria? How do we test them? How do we know the correct? And, and Claire pointed out the seminal paper from, from uh, Professor Maffei's group in 2012 that with these refined, stricter criteria to diagnose the classic type, and we now know that if we use those stricter clinical criteria, that the vast, vast majority of folks with classical type will have an identified mutation, and was even in the title of that paper, having that molecular knowledge allows us to go back and look at a selected group of people who we know have the same thing at the molecular genetic basis and get a much cleaner description of what the clinical phenotype picture actually is and what it isn't. Lacking that knowledge in EDS, we can only come up with expert opinion and consensus and our best guess, but we can't know for sure and we can't test it. But it's ever so important to do because how will we ever find the genetic cause if we don't get narrowed down for a more precise, cleaner group of people that we say have EDS. So it's critically important to have stricter criteria but it's hard to know they're correct. So what I just spent five minutes telling you is that the vast majority of the rest of what I'm gonna tell you is probably wrong. <laughs> but it's our best expert opinion and our best guess for now of what we think it should be, and only time will tell. So once we do publish what I'm about to show you, please don't take it as gospel any more than the criteria from 20 years ago were gospel. They were the best guess at the time, and we're still in the mess that we're in and only time will tell if what I'm about to show you actually works or needs further refinement. My hunch is it'll need further refinement. So we, we started off by going back to what the heck is Ehlers Danlos Smith? Back to Victor McCusick's work and Peter Whiteman's work and other original fathers of this field. And what it is is a heritable connective tissue disorder. The three cardinal features are that it affects connective tissue, especially collagen, that it causes joint hypermobility or laxity, and that there's some degree of skin or soft tissue involved. That's at the heart of the whole thing, that's where it all started. And all the rest of the stuff around it, we're still trying to figure out. But emphasize heritable, connective tissue, and disorder, and that has informed a lot of our thinking about the proposed diagnostic criteria. So heritable, of course, runs in families, doesn't have to be required. An individual could be the first one in his or her family to have a genetic condition but a family history would be consistent with the heritable condition. A positive family history would be consistent. Connective tissue features, joint hypermobility, skin and other connective tissue involvement, but emphasis also on the word disorder, or the idea that there should be some functional consequence. And this again can be somewhat controversial. I forgot on my prior slide to, to point out to you that I've got a red question mark showing up here and there. So, well that was interesting. Oh, your slides are still up. I just lost mine, but that's right. Okay. It's back. Um, so when there's a red question mark, that's where we had particular uh, disagreement or questions or, or concerns that maybe this isn't necessarily something that belongs. So this is all still a work in progress. But the idea that there should be some functional consequence might be manifesting with not just loose joints, but joint instability, subluxations, dislocations, that kind of thing. Some degree of pain and perhaps some degree of stress injury. And I'm about to work my way through all of this in a lot more detail and show you what we mean. So we've come up with this proposal. It's complicated. We're gonna spend a good 10 or 15 or 20 minutes going through this. Basically what we've come up with for now is that you must meet four criteria, that I've labeled ABC and D. A, there must be some form of generalized joint hypermobility or laxity. laxity. B, additional features of a heritable connective tissue disorder, emphasis here on heritable and connective tissue more than disorder. Right? And then and we're going to go through the subcategories of that, and there just has to be at least one of those subcategories. C is some functional criteria, that's more the word disorder. And again, there are some subcategories, and you have to meet at least one of those. And then D is you don't have something else. So there's a question in the back of the room here, and, and Claire gave a very good uh, discussion of the genetic differential diagnosis of someone who might have EDS. But I think part of the, the speaker, the, the person's question was, what about beyond genetics? 
And absolutely, I would say yes. There are other things beyond genetic things that can cause EDS-like symptoms. And, and yes, that has to be thought about as well. So the point of D here is, if there's something else that could explain your symptoms, and there's a test that can confirm that with high likelihood, then let's not live in EDS, because maybe you've got that other thing and not EDS. Let's not muddy the water anymore. So now let's really in more detail. Category A, generalized joint hypermobility. How the heck do we objectively define this? One of the other points we've kept coming back to in the committee is, how can we make this diagnosis something that you don't have to see one of the two dozen worldwide EDS experts to get diagnosed? There aren't enough people expert in EDS to handle a flood of people who might have it. We need to make this, if possible, something that we can put in the hands of the non-specialist healthcare providers so they can go through and do this assessment, at least as a first pass. So how do you objectively identify joint hypermobility? As Claire has already told you, most of us still think that the Vitamin score is the best test available, but by no means perfect and by no means the gold standard. Cutoff of five is, again, what we thought in our committee, some of the classical committee, is the best starting point. And lots of red question marks, should there be and how should we achieve adjustments for age and sex? Children are looser than adults, and the elderly are much stiffer than people in middle age or younger age. So should we have a higher button cutoff for younger people and a lower button cutoff for older adults? And since we know that men on average, at least adult men, are more stiff and adult women are more loose on average, should we have a different cutoff, a lower cutoff for males to be considered positive on the button score? And what about injury or trauma? What if you have had surgery on a joint or, or something else happened to a joint that restricts its mobility, but it used to be lax. <clears throat> so one of the questions we've been pondering is, would we accept, yeah, I used to be able to do that as positive on the Biden score. No one's really studied that long enough to know for sure. Um, and do we adjust for a joint just simply can't do what it might have been before? And then finally, of course, no, I'm sorry, not finally, let me go back to one other big problem, the Biden score. There are some studies that show that it does have good reproducibility from one observer to the next in, in terms of, of, of reliability of that test. But there's still a lot of variability in how it's done. So the studies that show that it does have reproducibility have imposed some standards, but when I look with my critical eye, and I can be a little OCD critical at times, I look at those papers and I still don't think they defined it well enough. So when you're talking about bending the fifth finger back, some people will say if the tip of the finger gets behind the base of the finger, that's positive. I'm a little more strict, and I want to see just that joint, it's called the metacarpal phalangeal joint, where the hand joins the finger. I want to see that joint go more than 90 degrees. Whereas if you take the tip of the finger, you've added two more joints, the two knuckles, into the equation. No one has ever objectively looked at this and asked, what's the definition of bending the fifth finger back 90 degrees? It sounds objective, but I don't think it is. Likewise, palms on the floor. I could do a push-up, and my feet are on the floor, and my palms are on the floor. That's not what we're looking for, right? <laughs> so how far in front of your feet could the palms be and still be positive? That hasn't been defined. And for the elbows and knees hyperextending, in my opinion, way too many people just eyeball it. And I have not yet seen a study, that doesn't mean it's not out there, I haven't seen a study that looks at the accuracy of guessing by looking versus actually measuring with a tool to see how accurately people can guess that that's more than 10 degrees or not more than 10 degrees of a new York elbow bending backwards. So a lot of work yet to be done on making the biting all it could be. But even that's not good enough, because the biting doesn't do a thing with the shoulder, doesn't really do anything with the hip, does little with the back, that's the bending forward and the palm signs, but there's more involved there. So do we need additional tools to assess for relaxing some of these other joints? And as I'm sure all of you know, the hips and the shoulders are some of the most problematic areas in folks with PBS, and the biting score is simply not addressing that. So we need more than we've got. We haven't answered it. We're just asking the questions or trying to illuminate the questions. Criteria B, features of a heritable connective tissue disorder. We have three subcategories, and to be diagnosed with EDS, or to meet this criteria for EDS diagnosis, we're proposing you have to meet at least one of these three, and then we're going to drill down into these in more detail. The first one is skin or other connective tissue findings. The second one is features similar to the Marfan syndrome. And the third one is family history. So we're putting that family history component in here with additional features of heritable connective tissue disorder. So now going into those in more detail, skin and fashion. And again, it's complicated. So you have to meet two of these bullet points in our proposed and likely wrong criteria. You need to meet two of these 
to then have answered criteria B of those four main criteria. And this is also important to think about for another few moments because if we indeed do go ahead with restricting classic type to what we used to call type 1, the more severe skin findings of those with a type 5 collagen mutation, it begs the question, what do we do with the folks who we used to call classic type? And many of you came and asked clear questions about what about me. What do we do with those folks who don't have the more severe skin findings? We used to call classical. 30 years ago, we would have called type 2. We're probably going to wind up bringing those into the hypermobile group until we get better at understanding what the heck is going on, what are the genetic causes, and maybe we'll eventually subdivide it. So we have to have more, we have to have more skin manifestations in here than I would have advocated 10 years ago when we were lumping all of the skin stuff into classical and keeping hypermobile with less skin. So again, a very fluid moving thing, which which we need yes, you're used to anyway. Right? So the criteria here, unusually soft or velvety skin mild skin hyperextensibility, because if it's really hyperextensible, you should probably be thinking about the classic type. Unexplained, unexplained striae or stretch marks. Emphasis on unexplained, so we're not talking about due to pregnancy, we're not talking about uh, due to weight change, either gaining or losing weight, uh, sometimes just puberty alone can cause stretch marks, but we're talking about unexplained stretch marks. Recurrent or multiple abdominal hernias, by which we mostly mean umbilical or belly button hernias, and groin hernias. We are not, we are not including hiatal hernia here. I am also a primary care internist like Claire, and I will tell you that technology has gotten so good that, I don't know an exact number, I would guess at least 80% of the entire worldwide population has a hiatal hernia if you get closely enough. The, hi the hiatus is simply an opening of the diaphragm that lets the esophagus get through so when you eat, the food can get to your stomach. Nature isn't perfect, and there's gonna be a little bit of a gap there. That's a hiatal hernia. So de-emphasize that. If, if it's a big one, it can cause a lot of reflux. Reflux, I'm not telling you it's not a problem. But by no means would that be specific enough to be thought about as a diagnostic criteria. Abnormal scarring, atrophic scarring involving at least two sites. So sometimes something just goes wrong at one surgical site and we're trying to be a little bit stricter and say, yeah, you've got more than one abnormal scar. Piatogenic papules are those little bulging uh, herniations, there's that word again, of uh, normal fat from the heel that kind of pokes out a little bit through the skin when you put weight on it. Literally, piatogenic is caused by pressure, and papules just a little bulging. Prolapse of the pelvic floor, uh, rectal prolapse, bladder prolapse, uterine prolapse, clearly something more common in folks with connective tissue disorders, and hypoplastic or absent lingual frenulum. The frenulum is that little tissue under your tongue that pulls it down to the floor of your mouth. So if that's less well-formed or absent, that's what lets some of you stick your tongue out and touch your nose with it. All right, so um, that, that, that we're considering part of the criteria as well. <clears throat> so that was item one of criteria B. Item two is Marfan-like features. Again, you have to have two or more of these. Dental crowding and a high or narrow color. And as I thought about this again in recent days, I'm wishing I put a question mark here. Because as we've written it for now, we said high or narrow palate. And I'm wondering if that might be too lax, better choice of words, too low, uh, too not strict enough. Or maybe we should have said high and narrow. But again, an example of where every single word can matter in these criteria, and it still needs more thought and more testing. But it's got to be the palate findings and the crowded teeth. And I think we still need to think more about high or narrow versus high and narrow. Um, arm span to height ratio and upper to lower segment ratio refers to the finding in Marfan patients, at least, of long arms and long legs with, uh, when compared to the trunk. So arm span to height ratio gets at the long arms, and upper to lower segment ratio gets to the long legs. Arachnodactyly is long fingers, spider-like fingers. Uh, so the wrist sign is wrapping the thumb and fifth finger around the opposite wrist, and you have to be able to overlap it um, a full knuckle to be positive. And then the thumb sign is not pulling the thumb down the skin like we use on the Biden score, the skin to the forearm like we use on the Biden score. Uh, this thumb sign is folding it across the palm, folding the fingers across it, not overlapping the fingers, and if the thumb sticks out the other side, that would be consistent with some loose joints and a really long thumb. Um, much above prolapse gets a red question mark. There are still some studies, I'm an author on some of them, that says much above prolapse is seen in Ehlers Down syndrome, and there are a growing number of studies that says, nah. Mitral prolapse is just common and not specific to Ehlers Danlos syndrome. So it's currently in the proposed criteria, but again, an area that I think needs more thought and more research. And then the urine dilation, you've already heard about from Claire, 
So we've put that in there as well. Third one, of course, family history. And again, as Claire said, we're limiting this to first degree relative. And I've underlined the word independently because that's important. There are some people who will come to me and say, well, I've got some features and my sibling or my parent has some features. And since we both have some features, that should count. Again, we need strict criteria. So to meet this one, it has to be a family member who's your first degree relative, parent, sibling, child, who independently meets these criteria without relying on any other family history. Once you've got someone clearly diagnosed, then you can use that as positive family history. Functional criteria, the idea that there actually is a disorder. Again, it must meet one of these three. And the three are joint instability in the absence of trauma. And it's important to emphasize here that once you have traumatically dislocated a joint, it is forever changed, and subsequent dislocations at that joint don't count. So you fall off the monkey bars at age six and dislocate your shoulder, that shoulder has been traumatized and will be loose probably the rest of your life. And we're trying to exclude that from these criteria. All right, so it's atraumatic dislocations or instability. Musculoskeletal pain, and again, the stress injuries that we'll talk about. So dislocations, instability without trauma, I forgot to put the or in here. So either or of these two bullet points would count for our proposed criteria for joint instability. Three or more dislocations of the same joint, again, without trauma, or two or more dislocations in different joints occurring at different times, or independent medical confirmation that at least two joints have spontaneous instability, again, without trauma being the underlying cause. So that's item one of category C. Item two is the musculoskeletal pain. Again, this is an or. Either one of these would qualify for meeting item two of criteria C. So pain in two or more limbs. So in this case, we're leaving out the head, the neck, the back, and the chest, and the belly. We're just talking about the two arms and the two legs, but we're talking about from the shoulder to the fingertips, and from the pelvis down to the toes. Pain in two or more of those limbs on a daily basis for at least three months. That'll sound familiar to the Brighton criteria for those of you who know the Brighton criteria well. And likewise, also similar to the Brighton criteria, chronic widespread pain, which now includes the trunk as well, going on for three or more months. And then finally, stress injuries. What we're looking for here is recurrent, not just single, events of at least two of the following categories, peripheral compression neuropathies, like carpal tunnel syndrome and similar things. Plantar fasciitis, inflammation where the connective tissue inserts on the heel bone on the sole of the foot. Bursitis, most common place I think for most of you, most of us actually, is the crater trochanteric bursa. For those of you who think you have a terrible hip problem but it's on the outer part of the hip, that's not actually your hip joint. That's a bursa, a fluid filled sac that overlies a bony prominence on the femur. And that's one of the more common causes of quote, hip pain that isn't actually in the hip joint. Epicondylitis, most commonly around the elbow, so golfers elbow and tennis elbow, and tenosynovitis, inflammation of other tendons and joints. So we're looking for two or more of these occurring on a recurrent basis, and this gets the question mark and asterisk because of the concern, again, with overlap with other conditions, even non-genetic conditions. So things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, other inflammatory autoimmune conditions can cause a lot of these features. So we need to be careful if we're gonna put these in the diagnostic criteria, we have to add along with that the caveat to look out for those other non-EDS conditions. And then fourth criteria, absence of exclusion criteria. So if there's another heritable genetic condition that causes similar features, or an acquired connective tissue problem, like lupus, like rheumatoid arthritis, then don't label it EDS. If we can give it a better name that's more accurate, that should be done. Item two here would be neuromuscular disorders. So if you've got something affecting proper function of nerves and muscles, that can cause the joints to be loose simply by reducing muscle tone and or directly affecting the connective tissue. So if your underlying problem is that the nerves and muscles aren't working right, you've got a mitochondrial disorder, you've got just really bad spinal disease that's affecting nerve signaling and muscles all by itself, let's not call that EDS. Let's identify what it is and, and maybe there'll be a treatment available for us with EDS. We just try to manage it. And then thirdly, more specific to hypermobile EDS, if there's significant skin findings, especially fragility, then you should be looking at other types of EDS rather than hypermobile. You should be thinking about classical, vascular, some of the rarer types. We left out a lot on purpose. 
So if you're sitting there thinking, what about my sleep and fatigue and POTS and GI and dysautonomia and the rest of this list? Those are intentionally left out of our proposed diagnostic criteria because of the two things you see at the top of the slide here. Non-specific, meaning it can occur in lots of different people who might have something other than EDS and therefore it's not something that helps us separate out EDS from other conditions of the general public. We're not well enough studied yet. So some of the newer things, Chiari, mast cell dysfunction, fascinating things that, that desperately need more research, but not, not enough evidence yet to say for sure that it's clearly associated, and even more than clearly associated, specific to Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and not seen in other conditions. So with diagnostic criteria, we're looking for something that points to EDS, as opposed to just, here's a problem with these management. And then finally, the uh, controversy about whether or not hypermobile EDS and joint hypermobility syndrome are the same thing. Um, so historically, hypermobile EDS, or EDS in general, has grown out of the work of geneticists, especially pediatric geneticists. The criteria from 1997 come out of Villafranche, uh, so we've been mostly working with those for the last couple of decades. And in parallel, as Rodney has said many times, and I suspect is about to say when he gets up to the mic next, um, in parallel, the rheumatologists, working mostly with adults, have defined the joint hypermobility syndrome, JHS, or sometimes just HMS, hypermobility syndrome, defined mostly by the very similar but not quite identical bright gene criteria. Uh, but over time, it's become apparent that both of these conditions are describing general joint laxity, instability, and pain. Both require exclusion not only of other conditions, but of similar other conditions. So we've all been thinking along the same lines. And regrettably, there is no gold standard objective diagnostic test for either of them. So nothing that can let us conclusively say this is or is not EDS or JHS. What many of us <clears throat> have observed is this lack of distinction between the two. And even more intriguing, many families come to medical attention in which some of the relatives got diagnosed with EDS and some with JHS. And to me, there's only two possible explanations. One is two different names for the same thing, and the other is a lot of families out there with amazing statistical bad luck. <laughs> I'm gonna go for the more likely. Personally, I think they're the same thing, but not everybody agrees. Um, I stole these next few slides from Brad Tingle because, again, I wanna channel him, and I think they're really good. So I think most of you know the cliche about a blind man examining an elephant, and elephants are big and very variable, right? Like EDS, it's big and variable. So depending on where you look, you'll see different things. And in the context of EDS, you might find things that are stretchy, like the ears. You might find soft skin on the hind quarter, but maybe not so stretchy back there. You might find in the middle that skin is neither soft nor stretchy. Uh, parts might be really flexible, like the trunk and tail. That's a younger elephant. The older elephant, some parts still flexible, some not so much. Sometimes the skin isn't soft at all and even gets rough. Sometimes it's shrieking in pain, but if you're not careful with your blindfold, you can really step in. Which, um, which I think we have, we geneticists and we rheumatologists and we healthcare professionals in general. So the statement from our committee was, our opinion is that hypermobile EDS and joint hypermobility syndrome are allelic and indistinguishable. We believe that they're identical. And we proudly presented that at the meeting in New York and in subsequent emails. And you've heard enough to know what I'm going to tell you next. There wasn't consensus on that. <laughs> so, a number of, of counterpoints made, but probably the most important one or the most uh, significant one that's been brought out in the subsequent discussion is what about people who clearly have some joint laxity but don't meet criteria for hypermobile EDS? We need a term for these people. They need benefits, they need services, they need to end their diagnostic odyssey and have an explanation for what's going on, and that is all true. But at the same time, we want to avoid over-medicalizing that population. So if you just got loose joints and otherwise doing pretty well, maybe you've got some pain that you have to manage, but you don't have a drastic syndrome, there is a psychological downside and a real economic and medical downside to over-medicalizing something that maybe doesn't need to be thought of as a close syndrome. And the final bullet point is a really important one. How many of you, again, show of hands, have felt disbelieved by another layperson or even worse, by a healthcare professional? How helpful is that? So if we don't have good criteria, if we don't clearly identify what is and is not EDS, we're just making this worse.
there's a risk of further loss of credibility if we don't clearly identify what we're talking about and have useful names that have meaning for all of these different things. So um, we don't have an answer to this. A new working group is being formed to try to come up with at least a position paper on where we think we stand on this. And with that, I have 15 minutes or more. I have longer. We have the next 25 or so minutes for discussion. So bring it on. <laughs> yes, sir. So I have an eight-year-old and she was diagnosed with hypermobility. But judging from what I heard today, maybe I misunderstood, or maybe not, it sounds like from what I hear is if she doesn't have the criteria for all the other types, people would just fall into this black hole called hypermobility. That's my first question. My second question is the the exclude the the exclusion uh, criteria mm -hmm. part, I guess the last bullet point. Yep. It seems to me that's also very loaded because I guess would somebody have to go through a journey to exclude so many things before they get diagnosed with the hyper mobility. Does that make sense? Do you want to join the committee? <laughs> <laughs> You just summed up a lot of our discussions, actually. Yes, exactly. So, so how do we address to your first point? What about this black hole, right? You know, it, it gets to be like the words fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. To some healthcare professionals, they have a very precise meaning, but to a lot of people, it's just a dumping ground to, to throw a name on somebody who has some problems that maybe no one understands. So we need to avoid that, and I don't have a good answer to it. Um, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to mostly stay out of giving individual advice here, but I'll tell you that an eight-year-old girl, I am always hesitant to diagnose with anything in this spectrum because eight-year-old girls are supposed to be loose. Now, maybe your daughter, and I don't want to get into the details of her right here, right now, maybe she's more loose than the average eight-year-old girl, but sometimes it's just your eight and your female, and maybe five years from now, you're going to be doing just fine. So we need to watch out for the over-diagnosis and over-medicalization of normal laxity of young girls. We need to watch out for, yeah, you're looser than average, but don't actually have that post down syndrome. That's part, I think, that's part of why we haven't found the gene or genes, because a lot of people got labeled with EDS who have something else. And in the, I am no fan of the international classification of diseases, the coding system that we have to use for billing, the ICD system. <laughs> No fan at all. But in the eyes, it, it's well intended. And, and, and in that system, there are diagnostic terms for just joint laxity without calling it Ehlers Danlos. And, and I think we need to get more serious about thinking about using some of those other terms and, and using that as, as the black hole, although no one likes to a black hole. Your second point um, was uh, about the exclusion criteria and just lengthening the diagnostic odyssey. And I agree with you, it's really hard to figure out what is a reasonable burden to place on a patient and what is a reasonable financial burden to put on the healthcare system to say that someone does or does not have a particular medical condition. And I agree, I respect that problem, I don't have an answer for it. Sure. Over here. Hi. Um, my sister was diagnosed with EDS. Um, she had like a six or a seven on the um, main scale. Let me stop you there for one moment, because a lot of people, I just want to make an important point, I'm going to give it right back to you. A lot of people come in and tell me, my score was this, right? And if I've got a nine, I must have really bad EDS. That's not the intent of the Leighton score. It's positive or negative. We have a numeric counting system to define positive or negative, but a score of five and a score of nine is identical with respect to diagnosing EDS. I just want to make that point. Right, well, the, the main thing was oh, about maybe 18 years ago, she had had a stroke. And in looking at all the causes that could have been, they diagnosed her with EDS. And I asked her, I said, do you have an EDS doctor, somebody that's looking at you? And she said, she said, oh no, you just treat the symptoms. And, you know, that's that's what you do, and so I think maybe they should change what they say in the in the literature to say that they should be evaluated more because um, she 
definitely has some problems that can be looked at. And she is a physical therapist, but she doesn't think she needs an EDS doctor. So or she doesn't need a medical evaluation or a genetic test. So I'm not sure exactly what your question is. I've got at least three to come out of what you just said. <laughs> One is, if her only major clinical problem was a stroke, I'm not sure that we should be labeling stroke patients with EDS. No, no, she, okay. she, it, she had a stroke, and in looking at her, then they did diagnose her with EDS, which she is very tall. She's 5'11", and, and looks like the textbook case of so, uh, an EDS. So I think she, so she, she has um, vascular EDS, but she does have the thumb that goes all the way back, and she is the hypermobile. She pulled her shoulder out in rowing and such. So she does have EDS, but she does not think she needs an evaluation or a genetic study or anything. So you're proposing that, that, that she may have been misinformed and she does need further evaluation and I go right, do that. Right. Especially if I think you just said right. she has vascular EDS. Yeah. And oh my goodness, while that is one of the most scary types of EDS to have, at least there's some treatments right. available for that. And so, I yeah. think her doctors are misinformed and I think what she was reading is that oh you just treat the symptoms, there is no um, and I think She's wrong. Huh? Wouldn't it be great if we had a support group that could, could you know, push that knowledge <laughs> forward and help educate more, more healthcare providers about that? That would be fantastic. Well, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> about the frenulum because I had seen studies about that and I was all excited at first until I saw some that said that they didn't notice it at all when they picked up on it and looked at people within their clinics. So I'm wondering how much that's being acknowledged. And what I had seen also was that the lingual was for hypermobility type and the labial missing was for classical type. So I didn't see it in Dr. Frankomanos. Is that part of it between the hypermobile and classical and the lingual and label? labial? Um, I, I think the best way to answer this is to emphasize again the point I made at the beginning, which is this is all expert opinion and anecdotal. So some of it is just who thought of mentioning what, at what point, in which committee. Um, so yay, we got it on our list, and I think that you've made an excellent point that it needs to be better studied to figure out how common is it, how specific is it, does it belong in the diagnostic criteria, or in fact are we misleading ourselves with just anecdotal observation. So both are, the, the labial for classical is also being considered? Uh, I can't speak for the classical committee, but I think that the whole point of all these discussions is to, to share everybody's thoughts, and, and one of Laura's and Shane's tough jobs is gonna be once all of the individual committees have finished thinking about things, they have to put it all together and make it all look like one unified thing. And I thank God that I'm not on that group. Um, <laughs> so, I, I don't know. We, we need to, to lay out what we think we know, and then we have to go back to the patient populations and, and do some good research and figure it out. So people are considering that, like the top geneticists are looking at that now to see if their patients are demonstrating that, if that should be part of the criteria? I can't speak to how frequently others are doing it. Frankly, in my personal practice, I've not put a lot of weight on the hypoplastic or, or aplastic lingual frenulum. It's something that, that I'm gonna start paying more attention to. And the problem again is everyone has different unique experiences and the whole purpose of this is to try to move from the anecdotal to sharing everyone's experiences and then trying to get better data about it. So I, I, you're trying to get a better answer of is it real or not and how important is it and I agree with you it's a great question that we just don't have an answer for. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Over here. I'm not quite sure if this question is for this session but it seems a bit best for today. Um, I have been diagnosed obviously with the hypermobility I also believe, because I have um, anxiety, depression, and I have symptoms of dysautonomia, where I have the adrenaline rushes, the nausea, the fight or flight response. Um, do you have any idea, because I'll be honest, I went to a cardiologist and he said I was borrowing trouble trying to get a diagnosis of dysautonomia. Do you have any suggestions on how to take care of the symptoms? Um, is there other people I should be seeing? What kind of doctors should I be looking at? So your question is on the management of dysautonomia? Yes. Especially the cardiovascular part of it? Um, I was thinking of the adrenaline, I'm not sure if that's all kind of wrapped up in the same thing. Right. So, um, 
I think Alan Fasinki is on for later today or tomorrow. Tomorrow. Alan will be sure to ask Alan that question if he doesn't answer it for you. Um, I don't feel like I'm your best expert for the adrenaline surges, uh, at least for the cardiovascular and the pot stuff. Again, anecdotal experience, my experience, I think the absolute best treatment starts with not water, but fluids and electrolytes. Many of you have discovered noon tablets or any other electrolyte tablet, and what I've gotten to telling my patients is never ever drink plain water, always put electrolytes in it, and there's no such thing as too much unless you're actually getting sick from the electrolytes. Second best is physical activity and compression garments, which actually builds tone, tightens up those muscles, and helps the blood get back to the heart. And then after that, I'm an advocate of slowing down the heart rather than trying to raise the blood pressure. So that can be meditation and mindfulness-based relaxation and, and other things to, to just calm down the adrenaline surges as best you can. And when you resort to medication, I usually start with beta blockers like metoprolol, propranolol, or tenolol, or similar, um, which can slow down the heart rate. Um, and all of that is in my gene review if you want to read that in more detail. Thank you. Exclusion yeah, um, I think my concern, as well as I think a lot of the people that I've spoken to, has been that with that being taken out and not, and it seems like not being used as any sort of diagnostic criteria, I get concerned about what you actually mentioned in the later slide about loss of credibility and about if we go to doctors saying, I have EDS and there's all these other problems, they want to focus on the diagnostic criteria rather than all these other things that seem to be so widely associated with EDS. I mean, I know it's an anecdotal evidence thing, but there are so many people with EDS for so many of these same problems that are so relatively rare in the general population that I guess our, my concern would be how do you keep it from losing the patient's credibility as far as these issues being connected and it being something that they should look for, especially because the whole zebra name and all of that saying, I have EDS and these problems, what can we do to figure out what they are? So you're talking about this slide and, and you're concerned that we're not putting these in the diagnostic criteria? Yeah. Right. So, I want to disagree with you a little bit. Mm -hmm. One of the phrases that, that I'm especially keen on there is you said, so rare in the general population. Chiari and mast cell, rare, but we're not entirely sure how rare actually, because maybe they're under-recognized. Um, everything else on this slide, actually not that rare in the general population. It's not cocktail party talk, so people don't often wear a badge saying, I've got anxiety, I've got pots, but, but those of us in the medical field get to see it a lot more than the lay public. Not that rare. Um, but really what I'm hearing you say is, is another really important tension of, I, I as a patient want to be acknowledged that I have all of these problems and they're all tied together. And that is critically important. My personal opinion is that historically, we as a group, healthcare providers and patients, have, have tilted too far towards doing whatever the patient needs to feel loved and supported and helped as best possible. And I don't want to say that's not important, but I think that has led us to the point of such low thresholds for diagnosis that what we're calling hypermobile EDX is so diverse and heterogeneous that that's why we haven't found the underlying genetic cause, or non-genetic if it's not genetic, but we haven't identified what it is because it's such a mixed pot. See the same thing about fibromyalgia, you can see the same thing about chronic fatigue syndrome. So the tension here is between the need to be much stricter in order to do better science versus the need to be inclusive and help each patient as much as they can possibly be helped. Has there ever been any discussion about adding another subcategory of EDS with these, some of these more multisystemic or turning it into more of a spectrum diagnosis? Yes. There's been some right. so, so lots of things have been discussed, subcategorizing hypermobile EDS. It's got its pros and cons. There's also the discussion of, as happens with many other conditions, even outside of genetics, have strict criteria that say if you meet these criteria, you definitely have it. And then another set that says if you meet these, then you, you, you're, you're, you're extraordinary, you're not totally normal, and maybe you have it, or probably, or possibly you have it. 
And some folks say, yes, that's great. That finally gives those people a name. Other people, you're shaking your head. No, other people say, no, that's no good because it still leaves it uncertain. It extends the diagnostic odyssey. It doesn't allow people to qualify for benefits. So again, you're, elucid, you're illuminating great problems that I don't think anyone has an easy solution for. My personal opinion is I think we need, it, I keep evolving on this. I, six months ago, I wanted to say probably. Now I think I lean towards let's come up with another name. And I think I want us to use one of the other names that's already in ICD-10 just because it's something that's already known. So we call it joint laxity if that's your predominant problem. Or something else, but let's be clear, that's in my opinion. And we're trying to reach some consensus, which we haven't achieved yet. Go back over here. I have two questions. One has to do with management, one has to do with exclusion. My daughter's 22, she has long fingers so she can circle her wrist, her tongue is very long, high narrow palate, generalized joint pain, but she also has, she's had a labral tear in her hip and she's had a meniscus tear and the greatest amount of flexibility, hypermobility is in her hands, but the pain in her ankles is enough that she's not really able to walk. So my question is, um, the tissue tear, the internal tissue tears, uh, is there, the, for the exclusion, is there something else going on? And then for management, for the pain in her ankles, how could we tell, they've done multiple, multiple MRIs through Oregon Health Sciences Universities, and you've done, no, her, the MRIs look perfect, but the pain is so significant. How do you distinguish between musculoskeletal tendon pain and neuropathic pain. And she's been to the neurodiagnostic lab at Stanford, and they said that they could tell that there's some neurological component, but we don't know how to distinguish, and I'm hoping through <coughs> distinguishing, we can have better treatment. So exclusion and management. Let's start with your very last sentence. A commonly held belief is that if I can just get a more precise diagnosis, I'll be able to get the right treatment. And your expression says you know that that's rarely true, but it's a nice ideal. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is I try to encourage people to not put too many eggs in that basket because diagnostic tests almost never make anything feel better. So it's important to get to management as soon as you can, even if you don't know exactly what's going on. How do you differentiate neuropathic pain from musculoskeletal pain is challenging. Some of it is his. By, by history and by description of the pain, but this is of course not as objective as we'd like. So usually nerve pain or neuropathic pain is described as numb, tingling, shooting, electrical, ice pick like, other terms like that. And then the musculoskeletal is more of the cramping or sometimes sharp, aching, throbbing, that kind of thing. But that's not 100%, that's a starting point. Um, there are electrodiagnostic tests to look at how well nerves and muscles conduct the signal. And I think up until very recently, neurologists were very, very close-minded. And they said, well, if the electrodiagnostic testing is normal, you don't have a nerve problem. Go see somebody else. That, fortunately, I think is starting to change. Um, there's another test that's starting to pick up in use, uh, doing a skin biopsy and looking for tiny little uh, I'm blanking on the details, I apologize, but, but there's some, some small nerves that, that can be absent sometimes in the, in the sensor, sensory nerve endings in the skin, that when they're present in decreased numbers, when they're absent, uh, that can be suggestive of a, a neurologic etiology for the pain. And I think we're still gonna need even more tests to try to achieve that better. But, the, but, but you fit again upon an important point. It's sometimes hard to tell, and sometimes it's not one or the other, it's both, which complicates it further. And then your first point was on exclusion. I'm not sure I followed what you were getting at. I, I haven't heard anywhere mention the tissue tears. So the, the labral tear and the meniscus tear, um, certainly other tendons that have torn. So why don't we have torn labral or torn meniscus in our criteria? Or that, whatever that, I don't know what that category is. It's like in terms of fragility. It's, it's a good question. I think we're going to think more about that. We have 10 minutes more for questions. Thanks. Let's move a little faster back here. Um, I just have a question about credibility with doctors. Um, a lot of my doctors have both HEDS and JHS in my files. Um, is it better to leave both of them in there or <laughs> to <laughs> Specify. Let me peel back the curtain a little bit more, and you won't be surprised to learn that money is behind all of this. So, 
when I was in medical school and residency, which is long enough ago that we just say it was a long time ago now, uh, the way doctors got paid was the more diagnoses you made, the more you got paid. So we were all incented to diagnose as many things as we possibly could. In residency, I was told, that's not enough diagnoses, come up with more. I was taught that. Nowadays, thankfully, we're moving away from that. We're trying to come up with fewer diagnoses that are more accurate and encompassing, and not, not come up with five different diagnoses that are all different ways of saying the same thing. But not everyone has made that change. As we get older, which I think I'm starting to, but I don't want to, it becomes harder for us to change our habits and our ways. It's just automatic. And then another element that's coming in here is the electronic health record. And because it's used in so many different ways by so many different people, it sometimes creates clutter and litter because there's lots of different lists that are similar but not identical. So there's today's diagnoses, there's your problem list, there's your past medical history. And unless you've got as much OCD as I do, a lot of people aren't looking at all those lists and cleaning them up and getting rid of the duplicates. So some of what you're describing might simply be that one person called it one thing and another person called it another and didn't notice that it was already there. So it's money and it's, it's not enough time to, to do a good job, I think. Over here. Hi, Howard. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> There's a light right in my face here. So. It's, it's Dr. Heidi Collins, and I wanted to kind of feed you something that maybe you can comment on, in a, especially listening to the question of the young lady that asked her last question over here, including mast cell activation, gut disorders, and um, uh, what was the other one? Dysautonomia. Um, I said, my personal observation in hearing about this and, and wondering whether or not it should be included in diagnostic criteria has to do with the fact that each of those things are disorders or syndromes that have specific diagnostic criteria of their own. And I think reflecting on it that either standalone syndrome we're thinking of as a, a primary disorder and whether or not those syndromes or disorders occurring in tandem in a person who meets the criteria for either standalone syndrome could be considered a primary or a secondary disorder. And what we don't know yet is without enough evidence, without enough research, whether or not those conditions specifically occur secondary to ehlers danlos syndrome. And I think that what big picture from altitude on this is that at this learning conference, we have speakers speaking about mast cell activation, dysautonomia, and gut disorders. So we are as a group acknowledging that they run in tandem. We as practitioners have to manage people who have these things in tandem. And I think that um, we need to worry a little bit less about whether or not they are specifically in the diagnostic criteria, but definitely acknowledge management and, and the fact that we as a group can't really um, specifically today do much about those physicians who really are, I think, committing a practice error by telling you you don't want to, to drag that problem of dysautonomia in on yourself. You know, just don't ask for that diagnosis. We'll just kind of sweep it under the rug. I think we are going to continue as practitioners to acknowledge that we're going to meet criteria. We're going to treat symptoms as they occur and problems as they occur. And I would just love to hear your comments on that about whether or not your group is considering in the documents that you're going to come up with management of these things. So my main comment is well stated, um, and yes, we are we are writing a lot about management. Uh, we weren't planning to get into a lot of detail about management of anything for which there's a separate working group because we were hoping that the working groups would do that. But but I, I think the absolute intent is the entire publication that comes out next year absolutely will be addressing all of this. Yes, very well stated. Yes, there are management groups getting this as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. So you're getting snippets of, of what's been done, but, but there's a lot more. Back here. Hi, uh, my question is about exclusion criteria. Maybe I misunderstood, but it seemed as though you were saying that it's not possible for a person to have EDS and let's say um, psoriatic arthritis. It, it, it seems as though you're saying it's one or the other. And in my experience, People have a lot of things. I have autoimmune conditions in addition to EDS. So, it's a very important point, and it's hard to answer. Can you have two different things? Sure. 
the more different things that get thrown onto your diagnostic list, I think the more one has to, again, ask the question, are you just incredibly statistically unlikely, or is there a lack of rigor in establishing diagnoses? So can you have psoriatic arthritis and Ehlers Down syndrome at the same time? Absolutely, you can. But it's important, I guess the way we need to state this is, in using these exclusion criteria, if one of these other conditions exists, subtract out everything that is clearly associated with that condition, and then go back and look, are there still other things that, in its own right, justifies a diagnosis of Ehlers Down syndrome? If we're not, and by we I mean all of the healthcare professionals, if we're not being that rigorous, we're back to the problem of labeling people with EDS when in fact they don't have it, and that does nobody any good. That doesn't help the patient long term, and that doesn't help advancing the science to figure out what's really going on here. But you make an important point. Um, I think we did, yeah, over here. Um, my name is Selena. I'm originally from Mexico City, and I moved to Maine eight years ago. Uh, I wonder if there's any research about if it's something that makes EDS worst, like food, uh, sun, or something like that. I live with EDS my whole life, and everything started getting worse when I moved to Maine, and they realized my vitamin D levels were very, very low. And the food changed, of course, and I was diagnosed with chiari malformation as well. Um, when I was living in Mexico, I also had a knee surgery, um, they didn't make a big deal because they didn't know I had EDS. They just did the knee surgery and I had a lot of trouble walking before the surgery. And after the surgery, I had a 10 wonderful years before the, the knee started giving me trouble. But here is like nobody wants to do anything. They don't want to touch me because I have EDS and they said there's no point to fix anything because it's going to go back bad. So it's been building things up, I think, and my body is just coming down the hill. So the issue with, with sun exposure, climate, diet, clearly very important to health in many, many ways. But I would urge all of us to be careful about automatically bumping that into EDS. Because even if you don't have EDS, if you've got low vitamin D, insufficient sun exposure, eating too many processed foods, whatever, you probably will feel worse anyway. So you ask a good question, does it specifically interact with EDS? The answer is we don't know, but there's a much larger body of literature that already says those problems are problems in their own right, and you don't have to layer EDS on top of it for it to be taken seriously. But you have to find someone who does take it seriously. We'll go over here. Uh, quickly, you mentioned mitochondrial. Does, is there a combination or a, I don't know, I got diagnosed with it, and I have H, H, or JHS, so like, I don't know if, it, if, if like my EDS could cause mitochondrial. Is there a connection to that? <laughs> the, so if you think these diagnostic criteria are tough, try looking at how to diagnose mitochondrial disease. I, I've tried for several years to get my head around it, and, and I think I'm gradually getting there, but, but I rely heavily on my colleagues who do it night and day. It's really hard to really interrupt mitochondrial illness, but what I do know about the manifestations of mitochondrial disease is Low tone is absolutely a feature. Disruption of virtually every organ system is absolutely a feature. So in your case, I would question whether you actually have EDS at well, all. Well, they said mine was brought on, my, my mitochondrials were on from extreme dehydration, like heat stroke. But I mean, like, I'm way double jointed. Like so so let's, let's not make it specifically about you, because I'm trying to help everybody. Yeah, I think saying. the important question is, if you have a mitochondrial disorder, is it inherited genetic? or did something environmentally happen to you to mess up your mitochondria? And then can you have EDS and a mitochondrial disorder at the same time? Sure you could, but they're each independently rare enough that probably it's one or the other, and one of them might be a mistake. But for any one person, it requires meeting with enough consultants to try to get a consensus. You'll never get unanimous agreement, but try to get a consensus. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Levy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Break session, which um, 